Arabe? Uh, you mentioned that you cannot write the gospel on a thumbnail, but sometimes you are in a situation, in a practical situation, that you have only got 10 minutes, quarter of an hour. So I think one needs to prepare to put the gospel on the thumbnail. Would, or would you rather be mute? Would that be the answer? The question which is at the same time an observation has to do with circumstances in which you only have a little while to bear witness to some aspect of the truth of Christ. Not an hour to give a lecture on all the aspects of redemption, but just a little while. And then the question is, shouldn't then you be prepared to give the gospel on a thumbnail? Or the alternative being, say nothing at all, say nothing at all. Obviously, one ought to speak. And if you can only say just a little bit about a certain aspect of the gospel, then let your witness be just a brief testimony to that particular aspect of the truth that the person to whom you are witnessing has time for. But it will be evident in what you say, because whatever you say will be connected to Jesus Christ, it will be evident that there is a whole lot more to the gospel, a little part of which you are witnessing, than what you are able to say so that you may have the hope that that party will give you an opportunity later on to say much more about the gospel than you have had at that particular time. We ought to say something if, if we have only a brief time. Yes, certainly should. Anyone else? Julian. Um, it's true to say that God can still use wrong context. There are grades, you know, you've got the Mormons on one side talking of complete falsehoods, and you've got, say, the Puritans on the other side who've got some things wrong but can still be a blessing to us. It seems to be, and even Arminians in the middle, can God not use them, and does use them, to some extent, in the building of the church? The Dutch have a saying that God can make straight lines with crooked sticks. But to my mind that means that God can use whatever elements of truth are found in the theology or the gospel of those who also corrupt the truth in important respects. But I do not believe that God uses the lie to save people. And I'm referring particularly now on your reference to Arminian theology and preaching. That gospel, according to one of the confessions that binds me, is the doctrine of Pelagius out of hell. And rather than to honor it by saying that God uses that theology for the building and saving of his church, I rather utter the warning that the result of the preaching of Arminian theology and liberal theology and Roman Catholic theology is to send many people to hell. Now, if an Arminian preacher opens up his meeting by reading the Bible, and he doesn't read out of the living Bible, but out of a genuine Bible, the authorized version, no doubt God could use that reading of the Bible to address someone in the audience to whom God wanted to speak. But I would want to make a distinction between a corrupted gospel, which... Arminianism is that 
dishonors Christ and His redemption, puts salvation in the hands of man from such a theology as the theology of the Puritans. There are elements of Puritan theology, important elements that I am convinced are wrong and destructive, but there were also many aspects of the teaching and preaching of the Puritans that were sound, and certainly God would use that, and did use that, for the gathering and building up of His church. Anyone else? Bill? What is your view on the way of preaching today? My position on open air preaching would be that we ought to preach wherever we have the opportunity to preach. But whether God calls His church to engage in open air preaching, which I understand to be stand on the street corner and to preach, that's another question. I'm not convinced that God calls the church to do that. But if in one way or another the opportunity would be there, I would have no uh, aversion to that and would be willing to do that myself. Stephen, did you have nope, something? Nope, nope, sorry. Oh, I see. Right? Anyone else? I can't make out your face there in the back. You're up against the light. Go ahead. Um, could you uh, give one or two of the examples of illustrations you had of how a witness to the truth must also contain a witness against the lie? I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to refresh my memory as to what I had mentioned here. When we say that God is God alone, we must oppose the lie that Allah is God, and that all gods are really the same God. When we say Jesus is Lord, we must also oppose the lie that Jesus remains dead in some Palestinian grave somewhere, and the lie that Muhammad is a greater Lord than Jesus Christ, and the lie that man himself is Lord in salvation, as though he is decisive in saving himself. There's my polemic against Arminian theology. When we say, as we Christians do, we have hope. An amazing claim. We have hope. And a blessed thing. What would life be without hope? What would life be? I think about that sometimes. If it were true that life is one D thing after another and death is the thing after that then either, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, you adopt the philosophy, eat and drink, for tomorrow we die, which is really a philosophy of despair, not a philosophy of happiness, a philosophy of despair, or you kill yourself, it seems to me. So, when we confess or preach, we have hope, then we also expose naturalism, and condemn materialism and the sheer this worldliness of much of Western society. So those would be examples of what I have in mind when I say that our witness is not only positive, but our witness is also negative. And I find this is something that is controverted today. And in Reformed churches, and I experience criticism from strange quarters for engaging in uh, witnessing that condemns error. But I find grounds.
ground for that also in that text in 1 Peter that I quoted. And Peter says, be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. The word translated answer in the authorized version is in the Greek the word literally apology. Give an apology. But apology doesn't mean an embarrassed excuse. Apology has the sense of a vigorous, no holds barred defense. So there's argumentation going on when you give a reason for the hope that is in you. Destroy the roots of the hopelessness of mankind outside the church as you give your reason defense of your own hope because of Jesus Christ. So I'd, I'd, I'd emphasize this, I'd, I intended to emphasize this in my speech this morning. Wherever I have occasion to explain what true preaching is or genuine witnessing, I make a point of it. I think it's necessary in our day to emphasize that that not only includes positive explanation of the truth, but also criticism and condemnation and exposure of the error that opposes the truth and has no right to do so. Anyone else? Yes, I'm Liam. I'd like to uh, refer again to what Anami asked, where you maybe only have a short time with someone, and also to what Man was asking about uh, the um, about opposing errors in our witness. But should the content of our witness be very different depending on what situation we are in and who we are talking to? The question is, should our witness vary with regard to the circumstances and with regard to the person with whom we are talking? And my answer generally to that question is yes. <coughs> Definitely yes. And I hope to address some of those issues in my final speech on the manner of our witness. I think uh, an outstanding example of the truth of what you suggest is the witnessing of the Apostle when he spoke to the Greeks on the Areopagus, the nature, not, not, not that he compromised the truth, I don't believe that, but the nature of his with the nature of the content of his witness was different from what he had to say to the Jews in the synagogue. There he opened up the Old Testament scripture and showed them that Jesus is the Messiah. If I'm not mistaken, you have both of those examples of powerful witness in the same chapter, Acts 17. First he was in the synagogue, and we see what he said to them. Then he's on Mars Hill, and we learn how he spoke to the philosophers and the Greeks on Mars Hill. And I would say, in general, that the answer to your question is yes, also regarding how controversial we will be in our witness, depending on whom we're talking to, what the circumstances are of our conversation. To a devout proponent of Mohammedanism of Islam, we would uh, be more controversial, I would think, than to some old lady that we bumped into at a bus stop who may wonder why we have a smile on our face in this dark world. So the circumstances, we have to be wise, wisdom in our in our Witnessing is an important quality. To know what to say and how to say it. It calls for Christian wisdom. That's part of the preparation by the Holy Spirit. Anyone else? Ballet. Well, uh, it's in connection with the whole teaching. Uh, 
in Hungary, I met a lot of uh, people who just uh, came to me uh, without uh, knowing me or without I uh, knowing them, uh, and uh, they just started to speak to me about God and uh, about. And so they tried to convince me to uh, go to their uh, church. So what can I do with them? Or what do you think about that? What did you think of that when they just came up to you and started to talk to you about God? Were you all right with that? No. <laughs> no. I feel uh, I felt uh, really uh, worried about it, and uh, it was really annoying. So it was uh, comfortable for me. I see. Brown. Uh, talking about our human uh, sinfulness, I think it's a very uh, necessary ingredient, uh, ingredient also uh, for us to uh, witness. Because the things are gives a need to come to Christ. It's, it's often left behind. But I think it's very important. Ram raises the point that is not only correct, but also <coughs> fundamental, that to all of our witness belongs the acknowledgement and confession of our and those to whom we are speaking's sinfulness. And that is not, to my mind, or at least in my speech, that was not a separate element of the content of our witness, but an aspect of all three of the main elements of our witness. God is sovereign in saving us lost sinners. Jesus Christ is Lord by His resurrection from the dead as the reward of His atoning death for our sins, and we have hope as sinful people because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But that has to be part of the Christian's witness from the pulpit of the church as well as from our lips when we talk to our family or to our neighbor or whoever it may be. That's correct. Jesus Christ makes no sense apart from this conviction of our lostness in sin. Anyone else? Pete? You know, the evangel means good news. Mm -hmm. uh, could it be said that primarily it's good news about God and His glory rather than good news for man? Or a conflict there. But uh, it's a testimony of God's character and who He is. And so it's, we can look at it on that emphasis, which, which we did already, and it's huge. As I see the point of your question, it is the relation of the good news to the glory of God. And that relation is this, that the gospel is good news for penitent, believing sinners to the glory of God. God is glorified in the proclamation and implementation of the good news to His elect but guilty and depraved sinful people. The goal of it is the glory of God. That must never be lost sight of. Not even the salvation of the church, but the glory of God. That will certainly motivate us to work at being straight and right in our content. <coughs> Anyone else? Yes, is that Manuel? Yeah. Um, in my experience um, in evangelicalism, whether liberal or conservative, I, I always got this impression that witnessing is only considered to be witnessing if you explicitly talk about that the person you're sinning to is a sinner in need of a savior, I 
think maybe implicitly you, add, you would have answered this question in your speech, but what would be your answer there, or what would be your position on that? I mentioned at the outset of exploring the content of our witness that all of the teaching of the Bible can be, and under certain circumstances, must be the content of our witness. So that witnessing includes more than speaking to a lost sinner of salvation in the cross of Jesus Christ. But everything comes back to that in the end, so that's never wholly excluded. But when uh, questions were put to Jesus or the apostles about various aspects of the Christian faith, they answered, and that was all witness. Whether uh, whose husband who will, whose wife will she be in the resurrection, or decency and order in the church, church polity. That's, to my mind, also legitimately, properly, the content of Christian witness in certain circumstances. Anyone else? Yeah, Julian had a question, then Stephen. Um, something you said really made me think, and that was that no one that says... Right. No one can say that Christ is Lord except by the Spirit. In other words, you have to question whether certain ministers and churches are believers if they do not believe that Christ is Lord and sovereign in salvation. But do you deny that there are people sitting in this room today who have become regenerate through the preaching of faith missions and Pentecostal churches? Because I think they have. And then they come into the Reformed faith after that. Well, I certainly wouldn't deny about anybody here how he has come to salvation. But I stand by the general observations I made earlier that I don't believe God uses the preaching of the lie to save people. That turns everything on its head. God uses the preaching of the gospel to save his people, not the preaching of a false gospel. But now, just what crooked sticks he may use to make straight lines, I leave that in the hands of God, the Holy Spirit, and don't pass judgment. But if one is truly saved, he will confess that Jesus is the Lord. And I agree with your conclusion that if one does not confess that Jesus is the Lord, he isn't saved. And the alternative to confessing that Jesus is the Lord, according to the text in 1 Corinthians 12, is, if not in so many words, then in effect to say, Jesus is a curse. Those are the options. No man speaking by the Spirit saith Jesus is a curse. That's the great issue. The days are coming when that's going to be the issue explicitly once again, as it was in the early church. Martyrs went to the state and to the lion's den because they insisted, Caesar isn't Lord, Jesus is Lord. We're fast approaching the day in which that kind of crisis will be upon the church and the Christian again. There's also this about that, that uh, statement in 1 Corinthians 12. That has to do with assurance of salvation. If you confess, if I confess Jesus is Lord from the heart, according to the Scriptures, that's because the Holy Spirit has saved me or you. I wouldn't say that otherwise. wouldn't believe that otherwise. So that's tied up with the precious truth of assurance of salvation as well. Stephen. My small uh, observation from witnessing to Muslims that the to get into a debate about the Bible versus the Quran about Christ versus Muhammad is a futile exercise. They're too well indoctrinated in their beliefs to get into that kind of debate. And that the real point of entry is the glory of God, and it is also man's sinfulness 
and the need for a saviour that the Muslim does not have a saviour because he has to earn a medic salvation but we have a saviour and that's just my observation. Thanks for that. That's practically important. Anyone else? Jonathan? Yeah, I would like to hear you speak a little bit on um, the content of our witness from the perspective of the development of doctrine, because you did mention the Apostles' Creed, which as we know is nothing compared to the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed again takes aspects of the truth to a next level. And then if you look at 16th century reform creeds and confessions, they're generally um, briefer and less refined and defined as the 17th century reform creeds and so on. How do you relate the witness there for the church, or the content of our witness, going along those lines, you know, in terms of, can you relate the content of our witness to eschatology, for example, and for the, the implications of the content of our witness getting clearer and clearer. E even in your own lifetime, you've seen the witness of the Protestant Reformed churches become more clear. You know, with the traditional covenant schism in the 50s, the PRC witness became even clearer. So, what, what are you, so, so the church members of your congregation have an edge on their witness that wasn't there before. Can you unpack that for us as believers so that we can get into the excitement of God developing the doctrine and the witness of the church? The content, as you said, is the same, and yet it does develop and it, it shines more brightly. Jonathan's question, in case you didn't hear it, concerns the relationship of our witness to the church's understand, progressive and developing understanding of the riches of the truth of Scripture. And he particularly and astutely refers to the confessions. Any discussion of the church's witness must include at some point a reference to the creeds or confessions of the church. They are, in a way, the content of our witness, the official adopted content of our witness. So, what the creeds teach ought to be, ought to spell out the content of the Christians and of the Reformed Christians witness to the truth. When I have the opportunity or the calling to witness to the person and natures of Jesus Christ specifically, then I better have as my content what Chalcedon says about the person and two natures of Jesus Christ. Another function that the creeds have is as a guard to the church's witness and my witness. I don't think more highly of myself, I shouldn't, than I ought to think. Whether I'm witnessing in books or in lectures or in preaching or in personal conversation, I ought to be running a mental check past my what I'm saying. Does this accord with the ecumenical creeds of the church, with the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the symbol of Chalcedon? Does this stand in agreement with the three forms of unity? But the real point of Jonathan's question was uh, to suggest what I simply agree with, and I appreciate his bringing that to our attention, that there is a progressive fullness and even some progression of correctness or orthodoxy in the church's confession to the truth of the gospel as the ages roll on. The, this regards fundamental aspects of the church's confession also. 
after Dort and at Dort, the Church of Jesus Christ confess the truth of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in salvation and the sovereignty of God in salvation more thoroughly and more accurately, more truthfully than the church had done before, including the early church as well as the medieval church. And when we, who are the beneficiaries of the Holy Spirit's leading the church into all the truth over the ages, and then even embodying that fuller revelation in creeds, when we make confession of God's work in salvation, then it's incumbent upon us, and it's especially our privilege to have been raised and taught that truth, to confess the truth of salvation in harmony with Dort and against every form of the teaching that salvation is a cooperative effort or dependent upon the will of man. That ought to reflect itself also in our church membership because church membership involves confessing confess with the church of which we are members. We want to make a confession that is as rich and thorough as is possible. Stephen. This might be a stupid question. No earlier stupid questions here. Right. <laughs> earlier you mentioned divorce and remarried. Right. Uh, especially concerning a professing Christian right. uh, and dealing with professing Christians who have divorced and remarried and have uh, continually refused to listen to being pointed towards scripture and the dealing with divorce and remarried is there a point where you just give up and walk away or do we continue to witness in spite of being pointed towards it. I don't believe that we have to uh, witness over and over to a person to whom we have said everything that can be said and who shows himself obstinate and hardened against our witness. But neither do I believe that I then go on having any fellowship with that individual. And by breaking fellowship on the ground of his impenitent adultery, that is a kind of witness by my life. We're going to hear a speech on that too. Not only do we witness by our words, but also by our life. Let me say about that, that instance that you bring up, of disobedience to the will and lordship of Jesus Christ, that's just an area where many churches, in my judgment, and many persons become timid and cowardly because the prevailing climate in even the churches is in favor of divorce and remarriage. And we get a hostile response when we witness to the permanency of marriage and the sinfulness of divorce except for fornication and of remarriage. So my answer to your question is no. We don't go over the same ground over and over again. There comes a point at which you don't throw your pearls before swine unless they turn and rend you also. But there's also this danger, and I think that's even more the danger with many, that professing Christians say nothing, tolerate, and thus seemingly approve of this disobedience to the will of Christ and straying from the Christian life. 